talking talking back. back. Welcome to Decision Space, the only show to take place right here in the space between the turns in your favorite games. I'm Brendan Hansen. I'm Jake Friedman. And this is the podcast about decisions in games. games. And today we are talking about drafting games, all about drafting games in a fan favorite what we talk about episode. It's going to be awesome. But before that, just a really quick note of housekeeping. We are in the process of reviewing entries and giving feedback for our first ever design jam, the Decision Space Jam number one. Uh, So we just wanted to give a little bit update on where things stand there. First of all, uh, thank you so much to the 22 people, again, who submitted entries. Or maybe it's 23 now who submitted entries for this contest. That is overwhelming. Uh, as we try, that's a lot of games. It's a ton of games. As we try to make our way through those for review, our plan is to do a sort of deep dive into the decision space jams, kind of what we noticed in some of the games, some of our favorite games that we played sometime in April, probably towards the, the end, end of, of April. April. <laughs> if you are interested in playing and reviewing some of those games, please do. If you're somebody who submitted a game, please try and get at least your minimum of three feedbacks in by the end of this month, if at all possible. But if you're just listening to this now, I don't know how long we'll keep these all up there, but maybe just for a long time still. So you will be able to go check out some of these cool games that we're covering, that we're talking about and reviewing and and give feedback because you know whether it's now or or in a month feedback's always going to be super welcome and appreciated by the people who entered this jam. So Brendan, have you played any yet? Are there any that you want to shout out just that you enjoyed so far? I have. I've played 3 and I've also played Jake's and I have been really enjoying the process. I will say it's reminding me I've obviously playtested a ton of games in the course of my design life. And it's reminding me how fun that is and how many cool ideas typically pop up in prototypes and how different of experience it can be sort of sinking your teeth into a prototype that's sort of like the untamed wild of ludological potential versus a nice package finish game that has its delights too. But it's been a ton of fun. As far as ones that I've really been enjoying and want to call out, I will say that one of the ones that I played... trying to pull up the name while we're kind of scrambling here i played one that was neat it had a lot of symbols which uh made it a little bit cryptic to get into it first it's called dynamic dice and it's this purchasing game in which you're getting income of different types and it's called dynamic dice because what the dice uh give you changes throughout the course of the game based on some decisions you make so i thought that one was cool uh, and i really enjoyed kind of delving into that one and found my footing in the mid to late game how about you jake I played an awesome game called Kanban D6 by Do Not Adjust in our Discord. And this one reminds me a ton of like the Ganshan Clever series of games where you have like a bunch of different like mini games that you're trying to complete. But here they're sort of all thematically tied together with like an overarching goal of loading up and sending out six trucks Nice. in sort of your your factory. So it's kind of like a manufacturing puzzle overall. The rules were just a delight to read, kind of some like funny jokes in there even. So I was just really impressed by this game. So happy to give it an early shout out on the podcast. So yeah, if you want to check out those games and others, head over to the Decision Space Discord uh, and they're there for you to print and play right now. Awesome. And then now we're going to just dive headfirst, take our Decision Space Telescope and aim it at the galaxy of drafting games, which I think is a really big topic. And typically these What We Talk About episodes go really well. We start with a really big topic and we start very high level. So let's start by what do we mean by drafting games, Jake? We're we're going broad, right? Super broad. Super broad. So what we have as a definition is any game where a core aspect of play involves players choosing between options. So this could be tiles, tokens, or maybe most prominently, cards. And I think that the key thing about this episode that I want to sort of make clear too is the goal here is to talk about drafting as a mechanism. So we just, and in my notes, I sort of framed it as drafting games and that's where I sort of started. But I realized there was probably a a richer conversation to have if we talk about drafting in games overall, that mechanic. And then we can talk about drafting games, games that are primarily just the whole game is drafting cards 
and then also talk about games where drafting is an important mechanism, but it's not necessarily a drafting game. So say something like The Lost Ruins of Arnak is maybe a good example. That's a worker placement Euro game that sort of has this deck building, deck building, deck programming aspect where you're, and those are sort of the, the key pitches, but there's also a card row where you're openly dr- kind of drafting cards from that row. There's some other twists on that where you have to pay for what's there, but there's light drafting elements uh, there as well. And then there's, you know, games like Star Realms where there's another card row and you're you're doing a sort of similar thing uh, versus games like maybe Seven Wonders or Sushi Go where the whole game is being presented with options of cards and then picking from those cards, sometimes with constraints also there, but it makes up the core of the decisions in the game. So we're going to talk about those two types. And broadly, I'd like to characterize drafting drafting mechanisms as fitting into two key categories that really shape the feel and type of game you often see there. And those two types are open information drafting games and closed information drafting games. Jake, I'm going to tackle open information drafting games. And then since I've been talking a lot, maybe you can talk about closed information drafting games. That sounds Does good. that work for you? Okay, yep. so open information drafting in games are games in which players draft from a public display. So that Lost Ruins of Arnak example I just gave, or the Star Realms example. Other examples that come to mind, both those games I wouldn't say are drafting games. Those are games that use drafting as a mechanism. Cascadia is a dra- is a game in which you uh, are drafting a tile and a token of an animal, and then building a little map in front of you where you're putting those elements that you've drafted. I would say Cascadia is at least 50% a drafting game, and maybe more. The decisions so much are you win and lose your games of Cascadia based around your drafting decisions. Though there's this cool little map puzzle you're doing on the side, it really feels like an open information drafting game. Uh, other examples are games like Seven Wonders, where Seven Wonders Duel, where the cards are all laid out on the table and both players can see what options are coming up clearly, uh, except for the hidden information cards. And you're going back and forth drafting from this open display. Uh, and Arc Nova is another game with some open information drafting as a mechanism where there's this card row. Uh, you'll, you'll see that in a lot of these open information drafting mechanism games there's lots of card rows arc nova is another one where there's a card row players can all draft cards out of that card row openly so you all have a sense for what options are available what other people are going for and where you might try to block each other or get in each other's way so that's open and, information drafting yeah and in arc nova too uh i think with our definition of drafting we would also consider the uh university tiles and mm, the kind yep. of partnership tokens as well as things that are available for draft for players to draft they come from a shared pool that we're all competing for getting access to the object that's in that shared pool of things yeah right and i mean and it's kind of an interesting case maybe that doesn't fit in well because it's the same exact things that are available each round um but I think, you know, from our broadest definition of drafting, right, something available that players are choosing between options of things, it fits in as well. And I think, you know, just while we're on the subject, it's probably pretty difficult to come up with a Euro game of a certain weight class that doesn't have something being drafted as as an element of it. It's just something, you know, giving a players a choice and letting them pick between options. Uh, it's just something that shows up everywhere as in in part of as that sort of open information draft. So on the other hand, we have closed information draft, and this is pretty straightforward, I think, which is when players are drafting from a hidden grouping, meaning a, a traditional uh, like a booster draft in Magic: The Gathering. You've got you open a pack of cards, you're looking through them. That's a hidden grouping of things for everyone at the play- table besides yourself. You'll select one and then pass them on and you'll receive another hidden grouping of cards. So that's your classic uh, Sushi Go type of draft. Where those and then those packs get passed all the way around the table typically. So then you get a sense for what might be in each of them. And then yeah. there can be a little twist where maybe you're not just drafting one card, but maybe you're drafting two or maybe you're picking two and putting one back or mm-hmm. there's so and many this- different... Yeah. And this can show up in other ways too, right? If maybe you have like a face down deck and the players can kind of like look at it, take one out and, and return it to the table as like a mm. smaller mechanism in games. But certainly this shows up less commonly than I would say the open information form of draft when it's like a smaller mechanism of the game. I think from a treetop view, uh, hidden drafting just requires so much more of the players that most commonly we see this being like the core part of the game 
when it does show up or or at least a significant part of it. Perhaps a good example of that being like a hybrid is Blood Rage where you have like a, a whole draft phase, but then you have a lot of gameplay happening between those three drafts that kind of make up the structure of the game. Yeah. And I feel like games that people typically call drafting games are often what they mean are these closed information drafting games rather than more open information drafting games. That That's yeah. at least the first thing I'd assume when I hear it, right? Yeah. I'm thinking of I, things like Seven Wonders or Sushi Go. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And like even a game like Santa Monica, which the mm. biggest perhaps, I, I would say like the definitive uh, mechanism in that game is the draft right that's yep. pretty much the main thing that you're doing and competing with players over on every turn people would still call that a tableau building game more so than a drafting game and i and i think you know i think maybe it makes more sense to call it a drafting game but you know that's kind of splitting hairs yeah and i think it has a lot to do with sort of the how the that game occupies the table space in some ways i do you think jake blood rage is an interesting example because it's it, the, the drafting is so key to what you can do in the game, right? You're drafting uh, cards that give you combat units or cards that give you powers in some ways or cards that give you, I guess there's the attack power, but then there's also whole strategies that you can draft into that you wouldn't otherwise have available. And yes, you're playing this sort of um, area control game on a map in between drafting rounds, but do you feel like that game, obviously the answer is it's both, but do you feel like the game is more a drafting game? Like when you think of Blood Rage, do you feel like, no, oh yeah, I'll sit I down don't. and play a drafting range? Do you feel like it's an area control game? I think it is, yeah. it It's tough though. It's, I mean, I don't think that ultimately at the end of the day, it's that important what, you know, we, sure as a How hive mind say, them. like this is this type of game. Clearly yeah. anybody who's talking about Blood Rage is also talking about the draft. That's a huge part of sure. the game. Nobody's going to overlook that. And I think, you know, the same with Santa Monica. It's yeah. also, yeah, it's the tableau building game too, of course. I don't really care, you know, what we're saying a game is. And maybe it's, it's you know, what it ultimately gets tagged as on Board Game Geek or, you know, whatever we think of it as in the hive mind has more to do with sort of like the look of the game than mm. ultimately like which like Where mechanism actually takes takes up the largest part of the decision space or has yeah. the most interesting decision space. Yeah. Uh, you know, with Blood Rage, you've got small cards and a giant board and giant miniatures. So the uh, even if, you know, the draft is perhaps like the most interesting or deepest strategic part of the game, it's hard to walk away from that game and not mainly be thinking about like the miniatures and the board and the stuff yeah. that happened there or fighting with jake and playing the loki strategy and the feeling that comes from that more visceral visceral viscerally emotionally yeah um okay so jake we've established these two sort of like error versions of drafting games the closed information drafting game and the open information drafting game and i thought it might be nice just at the start of this episode to talk about different formats that drafting can take and talk about sort of if they're open or closed and what they look like. And in part, I want to do this one because I think it will illustrate how flexible this me mechanism actually is and how widely it appears across all games, which I think is part of the reason an episode like this is interesting. It's sort of everywhere and it will let us get at drafting in lots of different angles and kind of get a a handle on what exactly we're talking about. But then also, I think there's really interesting case studies here of cool game ideas that people might be able to take away when they're listening and say like, oh, I hadn't thought of a game that kind of uses drafting in that way. So we can kind of accomplish both as we go through this little survey. Sound good? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. So I feel like the most natural place to start, the place that I went, was what you mentioned, a booster draft. So in some ways, the closed drafting game, the private hidden information drafting game, in terms of, at, I don't know if, in actual sort of game mechanism history terms, but at least in sort of the cultural mind share of when people think of drafting what they go to, started with Magic the Gathering. And people wanting a new way to play Magic the Gathering where you could have access to new cards and not constructing decks before, but part of the play experience itself was getting new cards and putting together a deck. So that's what Jake mentioned, a booster draft. Everyone shows up at the table, you open a pack of cards, it's randomized, you pick a card from it and you pass it to the player on your left, you'll receive a pack from the player on your right, and you do that again and again and again until all the packs are drafted. And I think that's sort of, to me, that's the, the basic drafting game. That's the vanilla version of drafting. Open yeah. a pack, take a card, and all of a sudden you get all the cool things about drafting games. You get 
things like having to assess the power level of cards in the first pack you open, knowing it's the most likely pack to get back, think through what cards are most likely to come back, and then assess, okay, should I take what I think is the best card here? Even if the second best card I'll get, I think I'll get back, I'm speculating in terms of the decision I'm making, isn't going to pair well with that? Or should I take the second or third best, knowing I'm likely to get a really good combo that's going to wheel around the table, go all the way around, and I'll get get it back? So I think, to me, that's a lot of the fun of those games, is thinking through how cards will wheel around the table and what type of decisions I should be making, speculating on what future options I'll have available to me, or based on what other people are taking, one in the same. Yeah, it also, I think stemming from a history with magic the gathering drafting is a type of gameplay that also fuels like really fun meta conversations Mm. and discussions and you know thinking where if players start to get consensus around like what strategies are really good uh then those strategies like inherently become less good because multiple people around Mm. the table start going for them so drafting packs of cards has this like really cool self balancing thing that happens upon repeated plays uh, that almost just feels innate with the mechanism. Uh, And I think that's, that's really a fun aspect of drafts as well. Self-balancing in a way that doesn't feel political, right? We talked about self-balancing when we were talking about player interaction in games where it's sort of like, Oh, this game can be self-balancing because everyone knows you just, if Jake gets ahead or Jake has the best power, you all kind of pile on Jake, but here it doesn't feel targeted at all. And in a booster draft, it's sort of private information. You're just, because everyone thinks that strategy is good, you're all taking a piece of the pie. And then all of a sudden there's not enough pie to support the strategy. I think Jake also booster drafts are just viscerally fun. It's fun to open a pack of things and see what randomly appeared together, whether it's a product that you bought or if you're playing a game of Bunny Kingdom and it's like, ooh, what cards are here? What what kind of interesting quandaries am I going to face comparing these like apples to oranges cards of looking at, in the case of Bunny Kingdom, like maybe spicy parchments versus a pair of territories that are adjacent in the middle of the board versus two, three mountain cities that could give me a ton of endgame points if I get all the payoffs to set it up. And I think that's a lot of the fun of drafting games too, is there not all games are fun from the first decision. And I think drafting games in terms of booster drafting is an example of a game where in some ways, one of the most fun decisions you get to make, depending on the design of the deck and the structure of cards and how the packs work, could be the first decision you make. In a Magic the Gathering draft, you open it up and the first thing you kind of look at is like, what's the rare? Okay, yeah. what are the uncommons, right? Like that's fun. It's exciting. Yeah, I think... Uh, just offering great variety is something inherent to drafting too. And I think that extends beyond booster drafting. You mm-hmm. know, it could be a, a open form of drafting or, or whatever. And you flip over the four, first four tiles of the game and everybody's like, like in a King Domino. And it's like, oh my God, there's like all of the mine tiles right at the start. That's weird and different. So this will have a different feel to this game than any other one that I've played so far. So I think that's another just big strength inherent to this mechanism. But I think the final point on booster draft I would make is this still feels like the definitive draft mechanic. If somebody told me this is a draft game with no other context or a drafting game, this is what I would assume I'll be walking into at game night. Yeah. And if in contrast, I said, Jake, want to come over and play a drafting game? And it was a not a booster drafting game, but a grid drafting game with open drafting. You might say, OK, Brendan, I see what you were saying, but this is a little different. So let me talk about what grid drafting is and what we mean by that. This is pivoting to a new draft format. Grid drafting are games in which there's typically a row, a grid of cards or tokens or tiles laid out on a board uh, or t- on the table in front of you. So games, as an example of this, are games like Splendor Duel or Sobek for two players. Jake, have you played Sobek for two players? I haven't played okay, either of these. Of okay, I well, luckily I have, and they're both by Bruno Cathala. I think these sort of open drafting games are actually a hallmark of the designer Bruno Cathala. We'll talk about uh, actually a couple more of his games later, and Jake already brought up another in the form of King Domino. And grid drafting games, typically what you're doing and why it matters is with this grid laid out, you have some sort of space constraint on what you're taking. So you're going to take either a group or a set of cards, and they have to all be adjacent to each other. Or in Sobek, there's this little token that you move around the grid of cards. Uh, it's kind of cool. It's an Ankh token. And whenever it moves, it faces a different way. And then you have to move it as far as you want, sort of in the direction it's facing. And then you land on a tile and you take it. So there's this spatial component to the drafting going on where you have to look at the grid of 
tokens or cards or tiles, whatever you're drafting and say, okay, all of this type of card is kind of grouped together. How does that inform the decision I should be making? Uh, and I think these cards, these type of games, these grid drafting games that are open drafting, we can both see what's there, tend to be a lot of fun, but they can also lead to a lot of analysis paralysis because there's a lot of information to take in. And you also have friendly public scrutiny of your decisions, right? If we're both looking at the same thing, and Jake sees a really good move for me and he's sitting there quietly not saying what it is. But I, I kind of see like, oh, Jake's a little nervous. It tips me off that there's a really good move I should be finding on this board um, that I could miss. Where in, in closed drafting games like a booster draft, the only person who knows if I made a mistake at the end of the day is, is usually me. Maybe yeah. the person in my life. Or nobody. Or nobody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. It, it It's funny too, like... S- Everything I learned about drafting all comes from Magic the Gathering. So this is another way you could draft Magic cards as well. I think they called it like a Rochester draft, where sure. instead of you know doing a booster draft, you could just open a single pack and everybody around the table takes turns taking one card out of that. Mm, yep. One card out of that pack and, and then create decks that way. It would take a much longer time and definitely be a lot more analysis paralysis inducing for sure did you know that rochester drafting magic the uh, wizards of the coast the people who make magic thought that that was going to be the default pro tour way to draft magic but they found it took too long and players were too uncomfortable with other people scrutinizing their decisions so they defaulted to booster draft because they're like we have to be able to run tournaments in under 20 hours yeah yeah. I think I learned that on this podcast. Did from you? you? Okay. Cool. <laughs> nice. Probably, oh, no, probably I'm on recycling. our probably on our Magic the, the Gathering episode. But yeah, the examples are wheeling, right? But yeah, definitely a lot of pros and cons to this format, and I think it makes a lot of sense that we see it come up most commonly in two-player games. Yeah, uh, where the zero-sum nature is a lot more okay and understood as a part of the game, and also just for length of play considerations as well. Yeah. Totally. Okay, do you want to do the the next version, Jake, or should I take it? Let's keep it going with you taking it, and then I'll I'll comment. You'll kind of comment. That sounds good. Okay, so this is one that I came up with that I think is an important example of I wanted to have as inclusive definition of drafting as possible, and these games jump to mind. So these are sort of what I'm calling push-your-luck drafting games. So an open information drafting game, kind of like the grid draft, where there's cards out on the table, and you're making a decision on if you want to take the options available now or wait for the chance of getting more, but you might lose access to the options that are there. So these are games like Colorado or Kanagawa. So in Colorado, it's a simple card game in which you're trying to draft sets of cards and you're laying them out into different rows on the table. And whenever it's your turn, you have a simple decision. Take a row or add a card, draw a card randomly and add it to an existing row. So this is a drafting game where you're trying to assess if your present options are strong enough that you should take them or if you should wait for a future option that you will think will be stronger knowing that you could lose access to some of the options that are already out on the table so colorado is sort of the most famous example of this but kanagawa the first ever game jake and i covered on decision space back in episode one another bruno cathal game is another example of this that uses a kanagawa like mechanism where cards come out and player you go around the table and you could take one of the cards uh, in any given row if no one does you add some new cards and then you do it again. And then if no one wants those, you add some new cards and you keep going. And I think that these games typically uh, end up being skill testing in a different way than say a booster draft. In a booster draft, you get to see all the options at once uh, and, and pick what the best options are available from there. Whereas push your luck style drafting games ask you more so, is this good enough? Are you getting mm-hmm. enough value now or should you wait in hopes of getting more value later? It's kind of an inverse of the regular drafting setup that has some of the same feel. It's interesting It in both cases, right? In all cases, drafting games are, or drafting as a mechanism is asking you to make some evaluation of the relative values of the options in front of you in front of you right like yeah drafting game is like which of these cards is the most valuable to you given the board state or whatever given you know the other cards you've drafted given all the data points you can pull together uh and use those to figure out like what's the most valuable thing and i think this form of drafting pushing your push your luck drafting is doing the same thing but like you say it gives you an extra tool where you can say actually none of these things are valuable enough when I, you know, to forego taking this risk for something better. I played a really cool Reiner Knizia game that is just 
this very much distilled down even more so than Colorado. I think it's called Summer Treasures and and maybe also Circus Flocati. Mm-hmm. And basically, the way this game works is, it, I think you get there are cards numbered zero to seven, uh, and then at the end of the game, you basically score points equal to the value of the cards in your hand and maybe also if you get a set of three you can like play them down for points right away Uh, but basically so more points is more better and you can keep flipping off cards off the top of the deck until you hit a double a duplicate of a number that's already out there and then you bust and it goes to the next player interesting so that really emphasizes what we're talking about here with like testing your evaluation like I, i have a zero a one and a three You know, like I could take that three now and that's fine, but it's not a four, five, six or seven. You know, what are my odds of getting a better number? And there's a couple other like little twists. That's not the entire game, but that's basically the the core decision space that you're working there in that push your luck drafting game. And I think that gives probably a good sense of kind of the special type of decision space that exists here. So I I do agree. I think this is a great include and it does feel like, especially from a decision space perspective, something that's asking a slightly different question of players, though still very much a drafting question. Definitely. And I think in these games too, Jake, push your luck games we talked about in our episode on push your luck come with high highs and low lows and drafting openly those high highs and low lows Uh, can lead to fun moments at the table, right? In Colorado, when you get some amazing card that comes off the top for you, you're going to be bouncing out of your seat, excited about, you know, flipping a, a, a wild card that gives you a ton of points, or maybe the opposite, where you flip a card that's just soul crushingly taking a ton of points away from you. And because of the open nature of the draft, you kind of get to have that shared experience at the table. Whereas sometimes in a, in a, booster draft version style of the game maybe you wheel some amazing pair of cards and you just kind of sit there quietly smiling grinning like oh yeah like (laughs) no one knows how awesome i just came out and i like that in the push your luck drafting style games oftentimes they're they're open so you get to kind of have those big table moments whereas sometimes the more closed booster style drafting games it's a more personal experience yeah one other interesting thing about the intersection between push your luck and drafting is is that relative positions among players at the table can be really different and impact the draft decisions in an interesting way. So when you're drafting, you're inherently competing against other people at the table for this like limited set of resources, whatever we're drafting. And in a push or luck game, Brendan, if I'm up a lot, then I want to play cautious. I'm fine with taking a two, right? In sure. Circus yeah. Focati and just getting two more points. You know, that's fine with me. Whereas if you're down a lot, you're going to feel the need to push your luck more and get something better that can like help you catch up and, and bring you back into the game. And I think that creates a really interesting dynamic too with the draft where we're now all of a sudden uh, it's since we're operating, entering that draft are from a very different places. It really changes the way we'll evaluate cards and, and evaluate taking risks. Totally. Yeah. Well put Jake. Okay. This next game, uh, next drafting format I want to talk about is called Winston draft. And I actually learned, uh, I think I knew of Winston drafting, but I was reminded of it by a BGG user storm parakeet who had this really great post on drafting methods overall that laid a lot of the groundwork for a lot of these examples. So I wanted to highlight it and Jake and I will put it in the show notes and on the website, uh, on the webpage for this episode on decisionspacepodcast.com if you want to reference it. Uh, But Storm Parakeet, and I'm actually going to read about Winston drafting from Storm Parakeet. So thank you um, because they lay it out really clearly. This is a draft method for two players that was conceived for Magic the Gathering. It starts with a deck of cards of any size. Lay out three cards face down on a table. The first player takes a look at the first card and then decides whether to take the card or pass. If she passes, she places the card back on the table, again face down, and draws a face down card on top of it from the deck. Then she can look at the second card and again choose to either take it or pass and add a card. If she chooses to uh, pass even on the third pile, she gets a card from the deck. So you sort of choose if you want a card, if not, add a card to the top of it hidden. Then the other player goes and you continue drafting this way until all the cards have been drafted. So this is neat because this is sort of a hybrid variant drafting game where it's open information and closed information because you both you have a sense for what will be in the piles 
if the other player doesn't draft them, but you don't have a sense for every card that's there. And then you also know that if the other player didn't draft it, that they didn't want it. And you might have a sense for what they did take in the past. So it's tickling a lot of the same sort of decisional knobs that you have in a booster draft. And then some of the same ones that are in an open draft. So it's this nice mix. It's fiddly. So it works best for two players. And then they mentioned that the board game Canopy, which came out last year, I believe, has beautiful Vincent Dutre art, actually uses Winston drafting as its core mechanism. Uh, So that's a nice hybrid version of a drafting game with both closed and open elements. Yeah, yeah. Another one that I have memories of playing Magic using this exact draft format back in the day with friends. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I'm not surprised to hear this one doesn't come up as much in modern board games just because, as you point out, it is so fiddly. Yeah. And and when you're playing, it says for two players, but you could definitely do you it with play more. for more. There's yeah. no reason it has to be a two player only drafting format. Uh, and I actually think it probably work, makes more sense not in a two player game just because it's weird in that case that it's like you, you might as well just have the cards face up pretty much Mm. i guess not really because you have to have the hidden information to see if you want to like look at the next card or not but it is weird that you just have to do just looking only at one new card and keeping everything face down for that reason alone which is definitely going to add just time to people you know remembering and looking at everything i think if i were to design a game using this either try and figure out a way to make it work for more players or add something like two or three new cards to the stack. So at least you're accelerating playing with a lot of new information every time you're looking at a face down pile of cards. I do think an interesting element here too, is if you're only looking at the top card is you introduce an even stronger memory element. And one thing about drafting games, just by the nature of how they typically work, if they're closed information drafting games, is that they tend to reward uh, players who have strong memories. And oftentimes the memory memory in skill testing memory in games can be divisive. And I think drafting games are one of the most closed information drafting games, one of the most publicly accepted, sort of the popularly accepted versions of memory and games being good, right? So in in those games, maybe in say a game of seven wonders, I really benefit from knowing the other cards that were in the first pack that I open. So I can make decisions in future drafts in future packs around what might come back to me. Uh, And that's part of getting better at a game like seven wonders is remembering what might come back. And if you're not doing that, you're really missing an edge potentially on the table. So yeah, I just thought that's kind of interesting. I, yeah, I, I missed that. This is, you're only supposed to be looking at the first card. I don't know if I played that way when I was a kid or you not. You would look at all of them. Yeah, but it is interesting how that just so clearly is demonstrating the importance of memory yeah. in drafting. Because I think part of the reason that like booster pack drafting or that style of drafting gets a pass is because it's less obvious the importance that memory plays in the game, right? Mm. I I think generally that's sort of like something that takes players a long time to kind of get to that level where you even need to really start considering it or, or where it starts mattering. And like, for me, we we recently covered bunny kingdom and that was an example of a game where it took me a lot of plays before I even started like thinking about that at all, because I was just focused on other aspects of the game. And it's, it's nice that it's there for players who play bunny kingdom you know, a dozen times like we did for the episode. But it's fine also if, you know, if you're playing with a bunch of new players, you're not missing out on anything. Yeah. Um, Maybe the person with the best memory has like some tiny edge in that case, but it's not going to be as like profound as what this is presenting where it's like, oh, shoot, it was that first stack that had the you know x card in it not the second one it's interesting too jake because the bunny kingdom example i think brings us to the forefront which is that let's just say we're going to play a game of bunny kingdom right and we all uh there's someone who has an incredible memory and then but they've never played bunny kingdom and there's someone who's played bunny kingdom a ton but they have a pretty good memory i think the player who has the the incredible memory say a photographic memory actually their skill their they're not going to be as rewarded by their photographic memory unless they're like crazy photographic and they can just memorize every card in every pack. But just to say they have a really good memory as the player who's played a lot of Bunny Kingdom and has a pretty good memory because the player who's played a lot of Bunny Kingdom and has a pretty good memory can remember the key cards that could come back and they're going to get sort of a reward for being an experienced player in terms of they know where to place their memory 
muscles versus just like, oh, that, that person has a wild memory so they can remember the right things. Do you get what I'm trying to get at? In some ways yeah. in drafting games, it's like a reward for having played the game. I think it's also more niche maybe than made out initially, like where and when you actually get the benefit of knowing that sure. X card might come back to you. You know, if you think about a, a Magic the Gathering draft, right? If I'm taking red cards as you know, my main color, or one of my colors, and I know that, okay, I passed this two cost creature, and I'm hoping that it maybe comes back to me because I would fit well in my deck. The only reason that information helps me is if it active, actively changes my choice in one of the other packs previous yeah. to that because I'm thinking uh, I already have this two slot co- covered, right? So maybe I take yeah. a spell or a larger creature or whatever, some, a, a color fixing for our Magic the Gathering fan in, in between because I know that there's a good chance I'll have this creature filling that spot coming back. But I think in a lot of cases, right, it, it could also just be I make that choice and that card doesn't come back and I'm actually just punished for making that assumption. Which is maybe a nice explanation of why it is so sort of like popularly accepted is that the actual advantage of having a really good memory where playing drafting games is not as large as it feels like it could be. And only matters at like the highest level of play. Play, sure. Okay, so this next example is in Magic the Gathering Circle. It's called Solomon Drafting, but it's also just I Cut You Choose. So this is a type of drafting where a player flips over some number of cards or tokens or tiles from a deck and then divides them into a certain number of piles. And maybe they divide them evenly into, uh, let's say it's a three-player game, into three separate piles of, of three. There's nine things they're drafting. Or maybe they make a pile of five, a pile of four, and a pile of one amazing token. And then oftentimes in these games, the player who is making the piles is the last person to pick. So you have interesting decisions around how do you structure uh, making these groupings such that you get what you want and then also don't give other people exactly what they want. These types of drafting games really force you to think about what other people want in games, which is another core element of drafting, right? That's that idea of what's going to wheel for me in the draft. And I cut you choose. It's more, what do you want? And how can I make sure you don't get it while I get what I want? Yeah. I, have you played many I Cut You Choose games? I've, I've, I think it's kind of like a bit of a blind spot. I've played me. a lot of I Cut You Choose prototypes, um, but I haven't <laughs> played a lot of I Cut you, you Choose games. And I think part of that is that oftentimes this it's really time consuming. It's a lot to take, say, flip nine things and have a player make N number of files where N is equal to the number of players um, and then have everyone choose. It's just a lot of downtime mm-hmm. for the players who aren't choosing from those things. Um, so the decisions can be really interesting, but practically uh, it's not always as exciting as you might want it to be. I feel like maybe these can work best as a really small decision yeah. in in a larger game. So I was thinking of one thing I was thinking about that I don't think is exactly right for this is like a game like Wingspan, which has mm. resources in the bird feeder. And, and some of the cards are sort of like, you know, you get to choose, like everybody's going to get one of these things and you get to choose who, who picks first. Uh, yeah. And then you can try and like craft, either take what you want first and just get it out of the way. Or if nothing is available to you, try and craft a situation where maybe by the time it gets back to you, you'll have a re-roll or be able to re-roll and have a better chance at getting it. You know, that's that's not quite right, but it feels, you know, choosing where we're, if you just have a set number of things and you get to choose where we start going around the table, that's almost like a mini version. Do you think? Do you think that's like a mini version of this? I think it's, yeah, it's definitely like getting at some of the same ideas. Yeah, but in a way that's just like procedurally a way simpler entry point that requires way fewer decisions uh, and just, you know, general taking in of information on the part of the person making that split choice. Totally. I think this could also work really well in a heavier Euro game where you're creating piles during the downtime in other people's turns. So maybe you take turns making these sort of groupings and it rotates around the table and kind of like in a feast for Odin where you can mess with your tiles on your turn on your grid in your downtime. Maybe here you're making the piles during other people's turns and when it gets back to you, then people pick and you know, so you're not wasting other people's time with making the decisions if it's the only the only mechanism, but yeah. it's fun decisions. I, I, yeah, it is. And it is a nice way of like, or maybe nice isn't the right way, but it's a way of kind of taking balancing choices out of the designer's hands and putting it squarely in 
to the hands of a player almost auction like in that sense yeah i mean you know probably people listening to this episode be like these are all auctions because every game is an auction like whatever (laughs) but it does feel like this in particular has like skill testing in the same ways for sure yeah of like it's it's making you not literally ascribing values but like saying like in general the way to succeed in this game would be to create the most equal sets possible so that you're guaranteed you know being the last person to pick is kind of inherent is inherently the worst position yeah so you want to create if you create exactly equal stacks then you give no advantage to the first player yep compared to you so right so it's kind of if that that's what it makes feel like what are what are the value of these things a last game i was just thinking about is isle of sky kind Mm. of has this uh, where you get three tiles one you remove from play and then the other two, I believe you assign a value to, like a literal value. Wow. So that's a kind of, kind of again, it's a little element of uh, I cut, you choose. But, you know, again, simplified and for pace of play and actual, you know, usability reasons, I think. Totally, which is really important. I think, so if that's an example of sort of asking players to balance in terms of decisions... Um, another way that you can use drafting in games and that we see in games is what I'm going to call variable setup drafting or balance drafting. And this, I was reminded of this by Krill in our Discord. Uh, and a good example of this is Agricola. So there's these occupation cards in Agricola that are really important to the pace of play because the occupation cards give you essentially sort of unique powers or things you can do that you wouldn't have without those cards. So they inform your strategic path through the game. And One way you can play is just by randomly getting a set of them, or I think there's a starting set that you all get the same type, but you can also play where you draft those cards. So this is a way of playing the game in which you start the play of Agricola, a worker placement game, uh, by drafting these occupation cards going around the table in a sort of a classic booster draft type version. Uh, And there's different ways to do it. Maybe you're picking uh, seven cards from packs of nine, or maybe you're picking seven cards from packs of seven, these sort of different variations that shift the decision slightly. But I think the key element here is that it's saying it's really hard for us as designers to balance these perfectly. And we think it will be more fun for the players to A, draft the cards because you can pull together interesting combos, but B, draft the cards because you'll be better at sort of pulling the most powerful cards out first and making sure you all get roughly equal hands if all of the players are roughly equally skilled at the game. Uh, And I'm calling this sort of, this is distinctive from something like Seven Wonders, right? Or Bunny Kingdom where drafting is the game. This is a version of drafting where you draft before the game as kind of a prelude or an intro, and then you play the game. So it's you're drafting your inputs, your pieces with which you'll play the game. It's not that drafting itself is the game. Yeah. I mean, probably the best known example of this is Catan, where you're drafting initial placements Mm. on the board. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it works perfectly. If you randomly assigned uh, placements in Catan, it would not be a fun game. You need the draft to balance out that game and make it fair because if someone, the board is randomly seated. So if there's a a killer spot um, and they get, two of the really amazing locations, they're just going to win the game. So Catan or Catan is sort of held together by the power of a balanced drafting prelude or intro. Yeah. Another really interesting example of this that I played recently is Age of Innovation, the re-implementation of Terra Mystica, which famously is a game that has uh, unbalanced factions in competitive circles. So uh, I, I haven't really engaged in Terra Mystica to this level myself, but I know that people who play it competitively will figure out ways to create balance prior to the game. And I think one of the ways is you see which factions are going to be in the game and then actually auction points for the more powerful factions. And the way it works in Age of Innovation, I think kind of taking a cue from the competitive player base is they've incorporated this balance drafting, I like that term, to the setup of the game. And here you're coupling the factions with distinct player boards and maybe also different like starting cards of some type and you sort of take turns drafting them so by the end of the draft you'll have one of each and both giving you maybe hopefully a more balanced setup assuming equal player skill but also giving you your own sort of identity where like i knew at the start of the game it signposted me really well in my first play because i was like i'm the goblins uh, you know, so I and I like this kind of 
territory type and I'm really good at digging. And, you know, that's kind of like what I'm going to focus on in this play. Gives you signposts. I think another example of a game that comes to mind, Jake, is Findorf. That's a game that is sort of a Rondell based engine building game, but card driven because the cards are how you get points in that game. Uh, and that's one where you can play with just assigned set hands. But when we've talked about this on the show, you can also draft them. And I think that games that do this are really cool because they give you, if you really enjoy that game, typically these balance drafts mean that you're going to be able to play it a lot uh, because it's going to be different every single time you play it. But the trade-off for this highly increased variability and depth is that it asks a lot of its players, right? You have to really understand the value of cards in Agricola to draft them well. And if you don't draft them well, in Agricola, you can almost completely, you can really put yourself at a significant disadvantage. And then you have a two, two and a half, three hour Euro game to play from a really disadvantaged position yeah. at the end of the draft. So that's the downside of it. Such so a, a good point. Upsides. Yeah. It's truly a double-edged sword because it yeah. balances the game if equal skill, but it just, you know, to the Catan example, right? If you have somebody who doesn't understand the game well and somebody who's really good, uh, it ensures an unbalanced setup yeah. as opposed to random. If the designers are your parent trying to give you a really good meal and they give you 20 bucks to go to the corner store to buy your meal and a piece of candy, right? Yes, yeah, so perfect. You go we'll and balance you... it by just letting you choose what you exactly. want. Exactly. <laughs> but if you just buy soda, you're going to spend the whole night hungry, right? Yeah. Um, it's kind of like that. Okay, so the next sort of drafting uh, format that I could think of was entwined drafting. This is a big one. This is another, usually where I've seen this is in open drafts, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be. You could come up with a clever mechanism to have closed entwined drafting, I think. Uh, but this is where you pick a pair of elements, either of the same type or different type of things. So you can pick A and B, B C and D, or E and F, but you're always picking A and B or C and D or E and F, right? It's that we're going to create a random grouping and then you're going to choose between these random groupings of things. So Cascadia is exactly this. You're randomly putting down an animal tile and you're randomly associating a terrain tile with them. And you're saying, okay, pick from these variable pairings of cards. And these entwined drafts, drafting games work really well because they create variably sort of variably valued lots that you're drafting, right? If you're in Bunny Kingdom, there's you're creating various values for the cards in different ways by the board state through the board state in Cascadia. It's by randomly pairing these things. And then you looking at your own board state and saying, okay, that's amazing for me. And that's not quite as good. Okay. These two things are both pretty good for me. Which one would it be better for me to take? What am I more likely to see more of in the future? Sort of mm -hmm. shifts the decision space. It kind of makes you juggle. Yeah. I, I don't know that this makes sense as its own category. I think it's just a subtype of grid drafting. Sure. Because, okay. right. Like if you had, you know, if you're playing magic and instead of putting out nine cards in a grid, you put three you put cards in each yeah, of sure. those spots or two, right? Yeah. You know, or a different game, right? You know, three different random resources here and three here and three here and three here and pick your set. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree that it's like the input, like the thing that you're drafting creates really interesting and distinct considerations from the other forms of drafting that we've been talking about, which is sort of assuming that each time you draft, you're just taking one thing. So I think it's an important note, but probably not like a different type of mechanism in my mind. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And it kind of highlights how all these things are are at their core sort of the same thing with these really minute twists, right? So this uh, next version, player range drafting. So this is in things in games like, say, Dice Hospital or Colorado, which we already mentioned, or Castles of Mad King Ludwig, a game where there's set prices and you're assigning the prices of tiles and then going around and picking them. It's all sort of open drafting, but the, the difference is, is that a player at the table gets to pick how the sort of sets of things are being combined to be drafted rather than them being done randomly. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting one. And maybe that fits... No, I don't know. I was thinking, is, is Isle of Sky more here or more I Cut You Choose? It's I guess it's more the latter, perhaps? Hmm. I don't know. How, so how does King Domino... I see King Domino in our notes under this one. 
How does that fit in player range? Maybe I'm not fully understanding this. I just wanted to put, so I threw King Domino here, not because I think it's player range drafting, but because it's riffing off a similar idea, which is that whenever in King Domino, there's four tiles that typically come out and you pick one of those tiles to draft, but then the order in which you are placed on those tiles informs the order that you're going next time. So Mm -hmm. in some ways, it's not exactly, there's no player. It's a time. Yeah. It's like timing plus drafting. You're, it's player arranged from the sense of you're you are having a decision around when you will draft in the future, and you have to factor that into what's going on now. Um, it doesn't and go here know. at all. Is the answer, and you know, yeah, uh, th- yeah it's that almost sounds feels like entwined too. Where it's oh, like, sure, it's more entwined right, than here, totally, yeah. right? Where it's like you're drafting a card and a position and to a draft position next card. Thank you. Y- yep. Yeah. Hundred percent. Okay. Cool. Which is a really interesting. You know, I don't. I don't think that made it into our King Domino episode in, yeah. in like such an explicit way. But I think that might be sort of like some of the special sauce that makes that game totally. so interesting for such a simple idea. What's actually a hidden entwined draft. Yeah. In a sense. And a huge part of that, Jake, too, right, is one of the cool things about drafting games is they're all about speculation. How much will I get in the future? And with that drafting of a draft order in the future alongside what you're drafting now, in some ways you're wagering, you're speculating on how strong the next group of stuff you can pick from is. Because in King Domino, sometimes it's sort of like if you get to go first, you're getting a huge payoff. And sometimes if you get to go first, it didn't really matter because all the tiles are basically the same, you know? So totally. What do you think? Here's an interesting one. Have you played Arboretum? Sure. What do you think that is a player arranged drafting game? So if you haven't played Arboretum, it's a really simple game where on your turn, you're basically drawing a card and then or you're, you're playing a card and then drawing a card. And when you you can draw either from the top of the deck or the top of another player's discard pile, right? So in the, in the sense, you're, on your turn, you're always playing and discarding one. So like in the sense, there's like a pool of four things to draft and say it's a three player game. Like that pool, pool of things to draft is always changing hmm. by the player uh, arranged input. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't I-, I wouldn't think of you know it's another case of a game that like you don't really think of it as like yeah arboretum it's like this drafting game like you think of it as like kind of like a tableau building game yeah but i do now that we're having this conversation it feels like it kind of fits as a a little bit of a drafting mechanism i mean a huge part of arboretum too is thinking about what you don't want to put into the pool of things for other people to draft right what you should be keeping in your hand so i think it plays into a similar idea of what you kind of like hate drafting in a way uh, which we haven't even touched on because this topic is so big and we'll probably touch on it it's it's a weird it's in the one. same re- realm yeah because there's also like some fluidity to it and the fact that we're all like taking a turn in between and having just draw a card being an option yeah makes something feel less like a draft in a way yeah like enchanted plumes right is that a drafting game okay so enchanted plumes is my card game in which there's a card row uh laid out on the table and to on your turn you play one or two cards to one of these sort of peacock plumes in front of you and then you're either going to draw from the deck or you can swap cards with this display i think it there's elements of drafting there. For There's sure. element it's, it's a of player row. arranged yeah. draft in the same totally. way because you can sort of swap. Yeah. But yeah. I would never call it a drafting game. But right. yeah, I think it's playing on the same idea, right? I have to think about what other colors people are going for in that game and make decisions around how much. I don't want to go into red if I think Jake and Paul are both going to compete hard for red. If the red card I'm going to get access to is is not that strong, right? I would need to have more of an assurance in the same way that maybe when I'm playing Seven Wonders, I don't want to go into science if I know three other players are going for science. Like, y'all can fight over it. I'll find some points over here, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's a really an interesting one where I almost feel like that. De- 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 it feels like both these games are kind of kindred games to me. Uh, in sort Arboretum of dis- and Enchanted Plumes? Yeah, and sort of the yeah, decision space yeah. they evoke. Yeah. And they feel a little bit like they have this player range drafting as as a small mechanism but it's weird to even say it's like a a small mechanism in a game that has like such a simple rule set you know we don't really think about those games as having a bunch of different mechanisms uh because it's like almost just taking a little piece of this you know and combining it you know with i don't even know what else 
I actually, it's so funny you mentioned that, Jake, because I've never said this on the show before, but in designing Enchanted Plumes, I had played Arboretum and had felt like, I, I think it's a fascinating game, but it was too harsh for the groups I wanted to play it with. So I sort of, as a jumping off point said, what if I took Arboretum and mashed it up with Lost Cities and created a more chill game? So that was literally kind of the jumping off point for Enchanted Plumes. And you can play Enchanted Plumes with a deck of Arboretum cards if you ever want to try it. But don't do Ooh. that. <laughs> but don't do that. Yeah, just buy the game. Yeah. And then you can play Arboretum with it. But don't do that either. Go buy Arboretum too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Bye. <laughs> okay. Drafting. Okay. We're so close to the end of these formats. And then I think, Jake, yeah. it's hilarious because we've gotten through a third of the notes and I thought we were going to get through half. So we'll have to talk about our part two that we can surely do. I think this is just highlighting. Like, there's probably... S- in my original vision of what these notes could have been probably six episodes because this is such a big topic. <laughs> There's the next so two, many types of drafting there are. And we haven't even talked about sort of the considerations and design or decisions and the skills tested. And that's what we'll talk about in part two of this episode at some point uh, in the future. But for now we'll just cover these examples. And I think this will be a really cool episode because it kind of will set up those decisions and frame them and a nice sort of starting point for people on drafting games if you've never heard of them. So this next type, Jake, is solitaire drafting, which I wanted to highlight. Uh, And my example is challengers. Challengers is a drafting game. There's no way around it. You're drafting uh, you're drafting cards to make up a deck that you're going to use to battle other players. Uh, but when you do that, you're not sharing a pool with the other players of packs that you're passing around the table. You're not drafting from a, an open display of cards, taking turns. It's the most simplified version possible, which is just that you, you're drawing cards off the top of a deck and you're choosing some of them, some of those cards to keep. To me, that's still a drafting game because you're still picking things from a set of things to add to whatever you're doing with it. And I think that that's a really streamlined, most basic version of a drafting game. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it makes sense to say like you can't have a solo game with a drafting mechanism, right? Yeah. So I I agree. I mean, I I, I do have to say just for challengers, I do believe it's possible that in a large game that uh, your drafting decisions can impact other people if you recycle the deck, right? Uh, in yeah. which case, yeah, because I took this card out of it, as soon as that deck gets recycled, right, you're less likely to to draw it on, on another time through. Yeah. But despite that, right, you're, it is definitely distinct from these other formats. That's like the thing that I'm taking from a pool is immediately impacting, you know, your ability to take something like these are distinct. It's almost like a delayed impact <laughs> draft or something yeah. like that. Totally. What other and- games have this mechanism? Can you think of any? solitaire drafting games i know there's others none are jumping out at me from the top of my head um but drawing cards from a top of a deck and choosing what cards you keep from yeah the cards i think that's drew something is just that such comes a up. core mechanism that yeah. comes up a lot right like i think in a lot of like kind of engine building games you yeah can kind of, like oh how about a uh, race for the galaxy even oh sure you, you yeah. draw x cards and keep one with that sure. like first explore action yeah, yeah, perfect. The explore action and race. Yeah, great example of a solitaire drafting mechanism in a tableau building simultaneous choice card race game. Yeah, perfect. there you go. Um, okay, and then the final one we've already that I had listed was sort of card road drafting, which we'd already mentioned, right? And so many games are built on this of games like Star Realms or even uh ascension just a lot of deck building games kind of this became the default mechanism following on uh dominions that's randomized the group of cards that are there the sort of follow for a grid draft for a grid draft yeah a lot of deck building although not spatially is that that a solo solitaire draft as well because your actual it's similar to challengers right where it's not gonna impact yeah Right, like it won't impact anybody else's ability to draft what they want until a, a pile runs out. Pile runs out, though it can if you're all playing with witches and you're just trying to smash the wishes in your deck. <laughs> that could impact you a little bit, but yeah, I think it's a similar idea. Yeah, where like the idea is generally it's like a solitaire grid draft. Yeah, yeah, which, totally. Which maybe is worth pointing out that all of these things could be you know mix and match together. Yeah. You can have hybrids of all these things. Yeah. To create yeah, and, like your own nuanced draft mechanism. Yeah, there's like an infinite sort of space in which you could iterate on different versions of drafting mechanisms, but they all yeah. go back to the sort of same core idea. Mine's like where you draft a card, but every time you draft a card, you have to uh, draft start a new draft. You know what I'm saying? 
Well, like, like a draft within a draft. Sure. Like the a Shahrazad draft. Exactly. Which, right. Yeah. yeah. You have to go You're, under the table to do your second draft. You draft a card and then you draft a card that pairs with that card and then you pass those pair of cards to someone else and then they draft two more cards that yeah. Then they pair yeah, with they, those and you pass them until you're drafting whole stories of cards passed around the table. Yep. We did it, Jake. I love it. The worst possible of all worlds. <laughs> Speaking of cumbersome and difficult to play. <laughs> That's kind of interesting though, Jake. So it's like reverse pack drafting where so instead of instead of drafting from packs of cards, you're building a whole set of things and you're trying to decide if you're the one who takes that whole set. Maybe you're like adding cards to it and taking it out. So you're like communally have, building packs. Have you I'm ever done an, this idea? Have you ever done like an anti-draft in Magic the Gathering where you uh draft the worst possible pool of cards you can and then like pass those pools, <laughs> somebody on your left and then there could be like two winners of the draft the person who actually wins the most games like and then also the person who's like deck did the poorest that's so funny no i've never <laughs> played that way that's yeah. hilarious that seems like such a teenager way to draft cards you, maybe where it's like you let's only just do get something to dumb. that when you're at like truly like degenerate levels of like just playing way too much magic because it's not nearly as fun gameplay wise yeah. but you're like congratulations here's my pool of cards it has a lot of powerful spells but only three creatures <laughs> it's like the keyforge <laughs> the keyforge var- variant where you have to play a low sass deck yeah, right? or, or, yeah. or reversal, right? You reversal. Your worst. You give yeah. it to the other person, and then they play it against you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I love it. Yeah, drafting for other people, a whole nother mechanism. So I think that this kind of really highlights sort of the that drafting. I wanted to really highlight how core to games and decisions drafting is before we delve into talking about different considerations in in designing drafting games and maybe our follow-up episode and also the decisions and skills tested in them. I felt like it'd be imp- it was important to talk through some of these examples um, to show how different they can be while knowing that all of these sort of different versions sh- really share sort of a core set of feelings and types of decisions being offered and skills being tested, even though they look really different on paper. So in some ways, when someone was thinking through designing a drafting game, you want to think through what the best tool is for the sort of flow of the game, knowing that sort of the decisions on the back end are oftentimes going to be really similar and the feelings evoked might be really similar. And you think through how you want to amplify these different aspects through the format of your draft. Yeah, I can't wait to have that discussion. And I was just in I do think this is still an area of game design that's just because of how fluid you can move from one format or or one type of draft mechanism to another, you can really create the perfect mechanism for your game using these tools. I I just played Robot Quest Arena and talked about that on the podcast. And that was a deck building game that I thought had a little novel twist to the card road draft that was just absolutely perfect for this type of super light family weight deck builder, which was that it had a grid of cards. So you have nine cards, the six at the top function as a card row where they're constantly being replaced. And then you have three at the bottom that always remain the same that have like your Mm. most standard actions. So it's kind of doing both things in a, an even like more accessible way to play. Like you're always going to have something you can use available to you on your turn. um, But you're also going to have, you know, the dynamic moving market at the same time so it's kind of i you know i hadn't seen that really before and it's like such an obvious mashup of dominion and star realms in that way yeah which of course the company that published uh robot quest arena the designers of star realms yeah yeah Yeah. um the power of the publisher of star realms i should say well cool um i would say for listeners let us know what games you think we should definitely mention as examples in part two of this episode uh once you hear this one in which we're going to talk about the decisions and skills tested in drafting games uh both open and closed drafting games and sort of different considerations sort of as designers think through all these different infinite variations of drafting games if they exist what are all the knobs they can go to and kind of turn uh and how does that affect the feel of the game that's going to come out on the other side and the decision space ultimately created. So I hope you enjoyed this sort of broad survey of drafting games and formats of drafting games of both open information drafting games where everyone can see everything on the table 
uh, and closed drafting games where you have sort of a private hidden group of cards and also these different formats as a way of setting up that future episode. I love drafting games, Jake. I think they're some of the most fun games you can play. And I'm excited to, to talk about them more. And maybe I can twist your arm and we can make it a 30 part series. All right. Sounds good. Well, thank you all so much for listening to this week's episode of Decision Space. As always, we should thank Hembry for our intro outro song, Reach Out. And we'll see y'all next week. Bye, bye, bye. bye. Close enough.